You're listening to The Jacob Balk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Balk. Here he is, Jacob Ball. Hello, sports fans. Welcome to another edition of of the Jacob Volk Show. I am the Jacob Volk, except no imitation. I've got to start with Cowboy Saints. Remember when I said I liked Taysom Hill? Remember when I said he was exciting? You can't deny that he was exciting. You can't deny that when he threw the football or whenever he took a snap, you had no idea what he was going to do. Was he going to run it? Was he going to throw an incompletion? Was he going to complete a pass to the other team? It was exciting. I was right there. I also said that the Cowboys would win by two touchdowns. They didn't, but technically, in all fairness to me, The Cowboys were favored by six and a half points. So, if you bet because of my pick, you made money. Because the Cowboys still covered the spread. Look, the reality is Taysom Hill needs to be a better thrower of the football. You remember when Lamar Jackson was coming out of Louisville? A lot of people said that Jackson needed to be a better thrower to really make it in the NFL. What you saw yesterday is what people who doubted Lamar Jackson thought they'd see from him. Now look, Jackson proved the doubters wrong because of his incredible athleticism and he actually got good throwing the football. Has he taken a step back this year? No question, but he's still light years better than where some people thought he'd be. Taysom Hill, as exciting as he is, all right, and you can't deny that he had some good moments. I didn't even think they were few and far between. He had some, like, really solid moments in this game. But he's just got to be a better thrower of the football. That's the thing. I mean, you can't throw four interceptions and expect to win. That's only happened once in NFL history. That a quarterback has thrown four interceptions... And his team still finds a way to win. You know when it happened? Last week. Sunday Night Football. Browns-Ravens. Again, Lamar Jackson. See what I did there? I mean, this was an infuriating game to watch. This was just a really tough game to get into. I mean, truthfully, I expected it to be better. Like, I expected the Cowboys... To be great. But they weren't. Their defense was great. Micah Parsons was fantastic. Same thing with Demarcus Lawrence. Same thing with Trayvon Diggs, Anthony Brown, J. Ron Curse, Oso Digizua, etc., etc. They all showed up. The thing is, though, the Cowboys' offense was anemic. They went just 2 for 13 on third down. They had 146 rushing yards, which sounds good, but dig a little deeper. One of those carries was the 58-yard touchdown run by Tony Pollard. Great run by him. 
All right? You see why some people say he's better than Ezekiel Elliott. I disagree with that, but let me tell you, Tony Pollard could start for a lot of teams. He's that talented. CeeDee Lamb also had a 33-yard carry. So that's two carries accounting for 91 yards. You take those two carries out of the equation, you're left with just 55 rushing yards for the Cowboys. It was so bad that when they needed to just bleed clock, Kellen Moore kept dialing up pass plays. That's when the absence of Mike McCarthy was really felt. Because you know that McCarthy would have gone over to Moore and said, what are you doing? Call more run plays. McCarthy didn't coach yesterday because he's out with the coronavirus. So Dan Quinn stepped in as the interim head coach. The reason why I didn't talk about it is because I didn't think it would change much. McCarthy doesn't call plays for the Cowboys. Moore calls the offensive plays. Quinn calls the defensive plays. McCarthy and five assistants tested positive for the coronavirus, so they didn't make the trip to New Orleans. Didn't mention it yesterday because I didn't think it would be a deciding factor in the game. And you know what? I was right. I mean, it almost was. In the fourth quarter, the Cowboys were up 10. They got the ball back with just under nine minutes left at their own 32. So what do you do in that spot? You milk clock. Even if you don't trust the running game, that's fine. Throw short passes. Throw screens, little hitch routes. Don't have Prescott try to push the ball downfield. What are you doing? Prescott threw an interception. Gave the Saints the ball back. First and 10 at the Cowboys 46. Little over 8 minutes left. They're only down 10 at this point. Not impossible. The Cowboys defense comes up big with an interception. Tipped pass lands right in the hands of DeMonte Kazee. What do the Cowboys do after that? Call a running play, get five yards, then throw two straight incompletions. So the Cowboys had two drives in the fourth quarter that only took up 97 seconds. You're up 10. That's not a safe lead in the NFL. You want to tell me you felt comfortable With your defense going up against Taysom Hill? Okay, I understand that. But you're playing with fire. The second you start underestimating your opponent is when you get sloppy. And then you run the risk of letting your opponent back in the game. Now, it didn't happen... Trayvon Diggs had the big interception. The Cowboys then forced the Saints to use all their timeouts. Hill threw another interception on the following drive. It turned into a pick six. I mean, the Cowboys played well enough to beat a bad Saints team. And make no mistake about it, the Saints are bad. They have lost five straight. They were five and two. Now they're five and seven. We can't look at them as a playoff threat. Flat out, we just can't do it. I mean, it's sad that injuries have killed them as much as It has, obviously, no Winston, 
Obviously, no Camara. No Michael Thomas, but he's been a non-factor for a while. It's sad. I mean, the Saints could have been solid. They could have been a threat in the playoffs. Injuries just killed them. I mean, it brings up an interesting question. Will heads roll? It's kind of tough. I mean, I think the one thing you can do is maybe reorganize your training staff. Reorganize stuff that goes into that. But even then, football's a violent game. You're going to have injuries regardless. I mean, the one thing I would say is Mickey Loomis may need to do a better job in adding depth. I mean, when Simeon took over for Winston, you thought to yourself that the Saints could tread water. Here's a guy with starting experience, has never been great, but has never embarrassed himself. He just goes on to lay an egg with the Saints. Taysom Hill laid an egg yesterday. The original backup for Alvin Kamara was Tony Jones. Jones has done nothing for the Saints this year. They went out and traded for Mark Ingram. Ingram hasn't been great. Ingram had like one good game for the Saints. The Eagles game, 16 carries for 88 yards. But even then he had a fumble. The Saints really need to upgrade their depth next offseason. It's over now. The die has been cast. You're 5-7. and seven. You've lost five straight. I just don't see how the Saints rally the troops and make the playoffs this year. I understand that they don't have a terrible schedule. Jets, Buccaneers, Dolphins, Panthers, Falcons. I mean, the Buccaneers game is a loss, but they can beat the Jets. They can beat the Dolphins. They can beat the Panthers, and they can beat the Falcons. Are they going to do it? No. There's no way that the Saints are going to go 9-8. and Just because you have winnable games doesn't mean you're going to win them. No team wins all their winnable games. The Saints are done. Forget about it. Lick your wounds. Get your high pick. And focus on adding quality depth in the offseason. As for the Cowboys, you cannot be confident in them if you're a Dallas fan. The last three weeks, they have not looked good. They only score nine points against the Chiefs. They lose an infuriating game to the Raiders. Then they have an ugly win yesterday against the Saints. You can't be confident in them going forward. I mean, will they win the NFC East? The answer is yes. And if you want to tell me they're one of the five best teams in the NFC, fine. But once they get to the playoffs, you've got to put them on upset alert. They really have not looked good these past few weeks. And you've got to write the shit pretty quickly. Look, season ends today. They're playing the Rams at Jerry World. They can win that game. The Rams have been an infuriating team this year. So, okay, you make it to the divisional round. You'd get torched by the Cardinals. You just can't have any faith in the Cowboys right now to make any sort of real noise in the playoffs. Can they right the ship? The answer is yes. I mean, the thing with the Cowboys is they are now 
at a point where four of their last five games will come against division rivals. They have two games against Washington. They have a game against the Giants at MetLife. And they have a game against Philly at the link. The penultimate week of the season, they play the Cardinals. Could be a playoff preview. The Cowboys control their own destiny. I mean, the one thing I'll say is, if this is the end of their rough patch, it's good to have gotten it out of the way now. Because you're at such an important point of the season. I mean, look, if you lose to Washington, you're giving them some life. Let's say Washington beats the Raiders on Sunday. And let's say they beat the Cowboys the week after. That game is going to be at FedEx Field. The Cowboys will be 8 and 5. Washington will be 7 and 6. They're right there in the mix. The Cowboys really need to get their head screwed on straight. Get the running game going more. Manage the clock better. Maybe focus on tackling a little bit more. I wasn't impressed with the tackling that I saw yesterday. Micah Parsons really... Didn't have a good tackling game. Neither did Kazee. The Cowboys need to right the ship quickly. Or else they run the risk of losing the NFC East. Alright, now it's time for me to make my three NFL picks. If you are looking forward to these picks, I don't know why. I am 15 and 21. I came very close to going 2 and 1. I picked the Seahawks plus 1. They ended up losing by 2. So close. If Russell Wilson could have converted on the 2 point try and Seahawks win it in overtime, I'm golden. So yeah. 15 and 21. Bet against me. I don't know why, but I'm going to pick two underdogs again. Did it last week. Didn't work. But I'm really not in love with a ton of these spreads. So I'll pick a couple upsets. Why not? I'll start by picking a team that I said I wouldn't pick again. I know I promised you that I wouldn't do it, but again, I just don't like any of these spreads. And given what I saw last week, I really think it's possible that the Jets cover the seven-point spread against the Eagles. The Eagles are just a streaky team. Okay, Jalen Hurts has games where he looks really good and games where he looks really bad. I'm not in love with Jalen Hurts. I'll tell you he's better than I thought he'd be. And the Eagles as a whole are better than I thought they'd be. But I really am not crazy about them. Hertz is a little banged up. He has an ankle injury. He is questionable. The game is at MetLife. Zach Wilson's first game back at his home stadium. His first game there since October 3rd. That was against the Titans. So his last home game, he actually won. Now I understand... That the Jets haven't won a game against the Eagles in their history. Seriously, they're 0-11 all time. It's the only team that the Jets don't have a win against.
But I really think that the Jets can cover the seven-point spread. Corey Davis is going to practice, so it seems like he could play. Obviously, they have Elijah Moore. The defense took a big step forward. I think the Jets can cover the seven-point spread. Give me the Jets plus seven. As for my favorites pick, I'm not crazy about this, but I'll do it. I like the Niners minus three and a half over the Seahawks. Basically, the Seahawks just look dead to the world. They've lost their last three. They're one and four in their last five. I really haven't been impressed with them. The Jamal Adams trade looks worse and worse for them by the day. The Niners this year have surprised me. They got off to a slow start. They were 2-4 and four at one point. Then they won four of their next five. Season ends today. They're the second wildcard team in the NFC. This game is in Seattle, which gives me some pause. But given what I've seen from these teams recently, I really think that the Niners can beat the Seahawks. And they can beat them by a touchdown. So give me the Niners minus three and a half. As for my other upset, I like the Falcons plus ten and a half over the Buccaneers. The Falcons aren't bad. Like, give Matt Ryan credit for making this work. Give Arthur Smith credit for making this work. They're five and six. They're not awful. They're not great by any stretch. But right now, there's a three-way tie for that final wild card spot in the NFC. It's between the Falcons, the Vikings, and Washington. The game is in Atlanta. You know the fans are going to be out there to support their team. Maybe they'll all be on a big high after the Bulldogs beat the Crimson Tide and knock Bama out of the CFP. But I really think the Falcons can cover the 10.5 point spread. I mean, that's a big spread, 10.5. If the Buccaneers win by a field goal and a touchdown with the extra point, the Falcons still cover the spread. So my picks are Jets plus 7, Niners minus 3.5, And Falcons, plus ten and a half. Alright, now I'll give you some college football vault talk. It is time for one of the best days on the calendar. Conference Championship Saturday. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. We have some great matchups on the docket. We're going to get some really good bowl games. Army Navy's going to come after this week. It's at MetLife Stadium. Sadly, I won't be going. I wish I could go, but I'm flying to Florida that day, so can't go. Thing is, though, it's going to be a route. Army's going to destroy Navy. Regardless, though, we have six games that we can look forward to. The first game is actually tonight. It's the Pac-12 championship between Oregon and Utah. It's really sad that this game has no bearing on the CFP. I mean, the previous edition of this game did. Two weeks ago, Utah beat Oregon. Knocked Oregon 
out of CFP contention. So, make no mistake about it. Utah has the advantage in this game. I understand that this game is at a neutral site. Two weeks ago, when the Utes beat the Ducks, they were in Salt Lake City. Tonight, they'll be in Vegas. That does mean something, but you know that the game that we saw a couple weeks ago is going to be fresh in these guys' minds. I mean, everyone's going to be thinking about it. From the fans, to the coaches, to the players, to the commentators. It's going to be at the forefront of everyone's mind. Now, how did Utah win? That's the question. Utah won by extending drives. They went 11 for 14 on third down. And by controlling the ball. Utah had the ball for 11 minutes longer than Oregon did. And Utah ran the ball down Oregon's throat two weeks ago. Tavion Thomas had three touchdowns. TJ Pledger had 10 carries for 46 yards. Four Utes had more than 20 rushing yards. Thomas, Pledger, Micah Bernard, and Chris Curry. That can't happen again. Oregon needs to load up in the box. Kayvon Thibodeau really needs to step up because he did not impress me in that game. Same thing with a guy like Popo Omave. Same thing with a guy like Brandon Dorless, Trevin Mae, Noah Sewell, and Masay Funa. That's how Oregon's going to win this game. As for Utah, you can do a little bit of reverse psychology. If you know that Oregon's going to be gearing up to stop the run, air it out. Now, can Utah do that? Cameron Rising is not a great quarterback. I mean, he's got some solid weapons around him. Brant Cuthy, Britton Covey, and Dalton Kincaid are solid players. I just don't see Utah being able to air the ball out against Oregon. Oregon has a really good secondary. Mikhail Wright and DJ James make up a really good cornerback duo. I mean, make no mistake about it. Oregon's a really good team. So is Utah. But it's very tough to beat a really good team twice in three weeks. It can be done. It wouldn't stun me. If Utah won, but I think I'm going to go with Oregon. I think the Ducks will get some revenge tonight. Moving on now to Baylor versus Oklahoma State. The winner of this game, the Big 12 title game, has a great chance of sneaking into the CFP. Think about it. If Oklahoma State wins, all they need is for Michigan to lose, Bama to lose, or Cincy to lose, and they're in. Easy. But even if Baylor wins, I think they have a chance to sneak in. The big question to me would be, would the committee put Notre Dame in over Baylor? Would the CFP, in essence, punish Notre Dame for being independent? Realize, 
they don't play in a conference. So they don't play on conference championship weekend. Baylor does. So if Baylor wins, I mean, that's impressive. I can make an argument for Baylor to get in over Notre Dame. Having said that, I really don't think it's going to come to that. A lot of build up for nothing, I know, but it's still worth bringing up. At the end of the day, Baylor's quarterback, Jerry Bohannon, is questionable with a hamstring injury. If he doesn't play, Baylor has no chance. All due respect to Blake Shapin, but I don't trust a redshirt freshman to beat this Oklahoma State team. Hallelujah. He beat Kansas State and Texas Tech. Those schools really aren't that good. So I can't read too much into them. Even if Bohannon plays, he's not going to be at 100%. I mean, I like Oklahoma State this year. I've been impressed with them all year. For starters, they have one of the best coaches in the nation in Mike Gundy. Probably the most underrated coach in the nation. Oklahoma State is always competitive because of him. Their defense has been tremendous. Their offense has been really good. They've beaten some really good teams. They beat Baylor. They beat Texas. They beat Oklahoma. They even beat Kansas State when they were ranked. Kansas State started off really good. Then they flamed out. So beating Kansas State early was impressive. Beating Kansas State late, not impressive. That may sound hypocritical, but think about it. What's the more impressive win? Beating the Phoenix Suns when they're on this epic winning streak? Or beating the Suns in February when they're not on a big winning streak? The answer is snapping the winning streak. Wins against the same team aren't always equal. I mean, Jalen Warren is having a really good season. He has over 1,100 rushing yards and 11 touchdowns for the Cowboys. Tay Martin is having a really good year. Over 850 receiving yards and 7 touchdowns. Defensively, the Cowboys are stacked. They have the fifth best defense in the nation in terms of opponents' points per game. I think Oklahoma State is going to win this game comfortably. Give me the Cowboys. It begs the question, will there be an opening for Oklahoma State? Yes. Yes, there will be. Because I have said for weeks now that in the SEC title game, when Georgia faces Alabama, Georgia will beat Bama. Nothing has happened that would change my mind of that. I mean, these two teams were destined to go at it for a while. And make no mistake about it. These are probably the two best teams in the nation. All right, I understand that Michigan is ahead of Bama, okay? I totally get that. But come on, if Michigan goes up against Alabama, who's winning? The answer is Alabama. It's not even close. And Georgia is an undefeated SEC school. Do I need to say any more than that? Me picking Georgia isn't an indictment of Alabama. Alabama's a great team. Bryce Young has a great case to win the Heisman Trophy. Brian Robinson has over a 1,000 rushing yards. 
Jameson Williams and John Mechie have over a thousand receiving yards. Bam is a great team this year. Georgia's just better. Firstly, Brian Robinson may not play. He has a leg injury. If he doesn't play, Bama has no chance. But let's assume he plays. Kind of tough for a running back to do his job on just one leg. It's running back. You need two legs to run. It's not hopping back. Where's Howard Cassidy when you need him? But even if Robinson was 100%, I'd still pick Georgia. Stetson Bennett has really put it all together this year. It's nice to see him right the ship. He's not a great quarterback by any stretch. Bryce Young is better, but Bennett's good. The Georgia rushing game is lethal. Four running backs have over 240 rushing yards. Zamir White, James Cook, Kenny McIntosh, and Kendall Milton. It doesn't get any better than that. Brock Bowers looks like he's going to be the best tight end in the nation for a long time. He has 37 catches for 652 yards and 10 touchdowns. Georgia has the 6th best offense in the nation in terms of points per game and the best defense in the nation in terms of points per game. How are you beating this team? But here's the thing. Bama's going to be so one-dimensional that it's going to be really easy for Kirby Smart to game plan against it. Just drop a bunch of guys back so that Williams and Mechie don't kill you. So I'm looking at guys like Lewis Sign and Darian Kendrick and Latavius Brimmy to really step up. Even some of the linebackers, too. N'Kobe Dean and Channing Tindall can step up. Even though Kendall Milton is questionable with a knee injury, I still feel really good about Georgia winning this game. I don't think it's going to be a rout. I think Bama will make Georgia work, but ultimately, I think the Bulldogs will win. So when Bama gets that second loss, Oklahoma State will move into the CFP. It begs the question, who's three and who's four? Would Oklahoma State be ranked ahead of Cincy? I mean, make no mistake about it. That's important. Who would you rather play in the semifinals? Georgia or Michigan? The answer is Michigan. Nothing against Michigan. They're just not as good as Georgia. I think I'd go with the Bearcats. I think I'd reward them by going undefeated with the three seed. Even the two seed I don't think would be unreasonable, but I know that's not going to happen. So if I'm looking at everything in a bubble, Oklahoma State wins and Alabama loses, the top four is probably Georgia Michigan, Cincinnati, Oklahoma State. I don't see how a two-loss Bama team gets in. But will Cincinnati stay undefeated? That's the question. They've got a tough challenge ahead of them. Going up against Houston. Make no mistake about it, the Cougars are good. They went 11-1 and this year. Now the game is in Cincinnati. But Houston does have a real chance of winning. Firstly, I've spoken to a lot of people who aren't sold on Cincinnati. Like, they really don't think they're that good. I disagree with them, but... I just wanted to throw that out there. If you're not in love with Cincy this year, you can envision a world where the Cougars beat the Bearcats. 
I mean, look, Clayton Toon is having a really good season. He's completed just under 69% of his passes for over 3,000 yards, 26 touchdowns to 8 interceptions. Alton McCaskill has just under 850 rushing yards and 16 touchdowns. Tajon Henry's having a good season, just under 500 yards and 7 touchdowns. Nathaniel Dell is one of the best wide receivers in the nation. Over 1,000 rushing yards and 11 touchdowns. Houston is incredibly well-rounded. When you think of a Dana Holgerson-led school, you think of an offense-first school, right? Well, not necessarily. Because Houston's defense is really good, too. Marcus Jones, Atlius Bell, Derek Parrish, Logan Hall, DeAnthony Jones, Chidozi Nwankwo, Nelson Caesar. The list goes on and on and on. I mean, look, it is possible that Houston knocks off Cincy. That is a distinct possibility. But I really don't think it's going to happen. At the end of the day, I think the Bearcats are just better. Firstly, it's in Cincy, and you know that Bearcats fans are going to be out in force. That's number one. Number two, Luke Fickle's a better coach than Dana Holgerson. I could very easily see Fickle leaving for Oklahoma. Number three, Desmond Ritter is having a really good season. He's completed 66% of his passes for 3,000 yards, 27 touchdowns to 8 interceptions. He's getting late first round buzz, and it's easy to see why. Jerome Ford is one of the best running backs in the nation. Over 1,000 rushing yards and 17 touchdowns. Alec Pierce is having a good year. 48 catches for 802 yards and 7 touchdowns. Cincy's offensive line isn't that good. There is an opening there for Houston to take advantage. But, Cincy's defense is really good too. Guys like Kobe Bryant, Ahmad Gardner, Brian Cook, Curtis Brooks, MyJ Sanders, etc., etc., are fantastic players. I mean, realistically, this could be the closest game we get this week. It really wouldn't stun me if Houston won. They're that good. But at the end of the day, I think Cincy is just a hair better. Cincy's favored by 10.5. Give me Houston. But I think Cincinnati will ultimately win this game and clinch their ticket to the CFP. Moving on now to the ACC title game. Maybe not. A game with CFP implications, but still a good game regardless. Wake Forest versus Pittsburgh. You've got two of the best offensive teams in the nation going at it. The over-under on this game is 71. That's like a 37-34 game. You know what? I could be talked into taking the over. This is going to be a shootout. The last team with the ball is going to win. You have two great quarterbacks going at it. Sam Hartman and Kenny Pickett. Sam Hartman may not get a lot of love, but let me tell you, he should. The guy's a cannon for an arm. Over 3,700 passing yards, 34 touchdowns to 10 interceptions. He's having a great season. And he's mobile, too. He's actually leading Wake Forest in rushing touchdowns. Now, both of these teams really don't have bell cow running backs. 
Christian Beal, Justice Ellison, Christian Turner, Israel Abanakanda, Vincent Davis, and Rodney Hammond Jr. are not A1 backs. They're not terrible, but they're not great. This is going to be chuck it, chuck it, chuck it. Hartman's and Pickett's arms may fall off by the time this game is over. Now, here's the thing. Wake Forest really only has one great wide receiver, Jordan Addison. He's having a sensational year. 85 catches for 1,353 yards and 17 touchdowns. You look at Wake Forest, they have two. A.T. Perry and Jaquari Roberson. They both have over 55 catches. They both have over 1,000 receiving yards. And they both have at least eight touchdowns. I think that's going to be the deciding factor in this game. At the end of the day... If Wake Forest keys in on Addison and doesn't let him beat them, you're relying on guys like Jared Wayne, Taser Mack, and Lucas Krull. That doesn't bode well for Pittsburgh. Wake Forest, if you key in on Perry, you have to deal with Roberson. If you key in on Roberson, you have to deal with Perry. This game is in Charlotte. It's a lot easier to get to Charlotte from Wake Forest University than it is the University of Pittsburgh. So I'm going to go with the Demon Deacons. Moving on now to Iowa, Michigan. By far and away the most interesting game that's on the docket for tomorrow. I had said for a while that OSU would destroy Iowa. They're not going to get the chance to destroy Iowa. Michigan's going to get that chance. Will Michigan be able to beat the Hawkeyes? Will they win another big game? It's something that they really haven't been able to do in the Jim Harbaugh era. Granted, they knocked off OSU... All right, Harbaugh got that monkey off his back. Give him credit, but there's more to do. At the end of the day, if Michigan loses tomorrow, they're out of the CFP. All right, Notre Dame probably goes in. So can Michigan beat Iowa? That's the question. The answer is yes. Iowa is your typical ground-and-pound team. You remember the early Rex Ryan teams when he was with the Jets that would run the ball behind that great offensive line and would just kill you with defense? That's what this Iowa team is. And the same thing holds for Michigan. It's just that Cade McNamara is Better than Spencer Petras. At the end of the day, Tyler Goodson's a really good running back. So is Hassan Haskins. And you know that Blake Corum is going to get his. So which offense is going to do enough? Because you know this is going to be a low-scoring game. The over-under is 43.5. Take the under. All right, this could be 33 and a half. I may take the under. It wouldn't surprise me if this was like a 10-7 game. At the end of the day, Michigan's offense is better. You know both of these defenses are going to be great. So it's going to come down to which offense can do enough to win. Which offense has what it takes to score in those key moments. At the end of the day... Michigan's offense is better than Iowa's offense. Don't let the stats fool you. 
Michigan doesn't have a juggernaut of an offense. It's a ground and pound offense. It works. It gets the job done. They ran rough shot over OSU. And OSU has a really good defense. They ran rough shot over Penn State. Penn State has a really good defense. They even ran the ball well against Michigan State. Michigan State has a good defense. I think Michigan is going to win this game. It's going to be a low-scoring game. It wouldn't stun me if Iowa won, but I'm going to go with the Wolverines. So based on all that, my top four will be Georgia, Michigan, Oklahoma State, Cincinnati. I'll close this show out with some NBA Volk talk. Specifically, the drubbing that happened in Memphis last night. No, that is not a typo. Your phone is not glitching. There was no mistake made On the bottom line, the Grizzlies really beat the Thunder 152-79. to If you can't do that math, that means that the Grizzlies beat the Thunder by 73 points. That is the biggest margin of victory in NBA history. Just to give you some stats, the Thunder shot 33% from the field and 29% from beyond the arc. That's bad enough. You know what the Grizzlies did offensively? They shot 62% from the field and 53% from beyond the arc. The Grizzlies doubled up the Thunder in rebounds. They almost tripled up the Thunder in assists. The Grizzlies had 16 steals. You know how many points in the paint the Grizzlies had? 82. That means that if the Grizzlies didn't hit a single mid-range shot, a single three-pointer, a single free throw... They'd still beat the Thunder. They once led by 78 points. I'm following the game on my phone, and it's like, wait a minute. Are the Grizzlies actually going to double up the Thunder? Is this really going to be like a college score? Fortunately, the Thunder didn't get doubled up, but that's about the only thing they did right. You know what the halftime score was? 72 to 36. Here's my question. Guys like Aaron Wiggins, Vic Krejci, and Eve Pons... I think were available to play. I don't think they were in the G League. I know that Teo Maladon was. But I don't think those other guys were. Why didn't they get in? I mean, you want to tell me that this is what happens when the Thunder are without Shea and Josh Giddy? No, 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 no. That is no excuse to lose by 73 points. The only way that you could do that in 2K would be to turn all the sliders down and play on rookie. Also, not for nothing, but the Grizzlies were without their best player, John Morant. So I don't want to hear the injury nonsense. The reality is, the NBA needs to get involved. Because realistically, the Thunder 
only had like one NBA player on the floor last night. Lou Dort. Dort's a good player. I really like him. Everyone else who you saw is useless. If I'm being generous, Darius Baisley is a rotational player. But even then, he's at the bottom of the rotation. Guy shooting 34.8% from the field. Jeremiah Robinson Earl maybe has a little potential. But again, he's a back-of-the-rotation piece at best. He's playing 22 minutes per game for the Thunder. Baisley is playing 27 minutes per game for the Thunder. You cannot have these NBA teams putting out players that in no way, shape, or form should be in the NBA. The NBA should be reserved for the best basketball players on the planet. You want to tell me that some Europeans don't want to leave Europe? Or some players over in China don't want to leave China? Okay, I understand that. So maybe 98% of the best basketball players in the world play in the NBA. The Thunder somehow, some way, figured out a way to make it so they really only have like four guys on their team that are really good players. All right. Shea is great. Lou Dort's really good. Darius Baisley's solid. And Jeremiah Robinson Earl is solid. Everyone else is useless on that team. You can't expect your fans to sacrifice their time to watch these ham and eggers play. How many Thunder fans do you think would recognize Gabriel Deck if he came to their house and delivered them a pizza? What about Paul Watson? What about Alexei Pokashevsky? No one's recognizing these guys. These guys aren't NBA players. And the NBA should punish the Thunder for putting out a product that is this embarrassing. It's one thing to tank, okay? In the NBA, if you're not going to be a championship contender, it's better to tank. Okay, I understand that. But if you're going to tank, do so respectably. Do so by playing guys that at least have futures in the NBA. Not only four guys who fall into that category, half of whom are probably back-of-the-rotation players at best. To anyone who stayed for that whole game, God bless you. I'd have left after the third quarter. Maybe even before then. You want to tell me that people just want to watch the world burn? I get that, but you can do that on TV. You can get home a little early. Realize it's a Thursday night. You still have to work on Fridays. The Thunder should be punished for this. Not just based on this loss. But based on the fact that they are throwing this season away without even trying. Alright? Teams shouldn't be rewarded for intentionally losing games. And that's what the Thunder are trying to do. You want to stop tanking? You want competitive integrity to return to the NBA? This is how you do it. You establish the NBA Tanking Committee. Five former coaches, five former executives, and five members of the media get into a room or a Zoom meeting, whatever. They go through every non-playoff team 
and they say, was this team intentionally setting out to lose games before the season started? If you want to pivot after the season starts, I get it. All right, the Pelicans try to contend. It's just that Zion hasn't played a game this year, so they shouldn't be punished. But a team like the Thunder, they should be punished. I don't know who else would fall into that category. I would really need to think about it. But I'll tell you, you know what the consequence should be? You want to stop tanking? Give the NBA tanking committee the power to strip the Thunder of all their picks. Every single pick that they have in this coming draft gets taken away from them. The draft is just shortened. All right, I don't know how many picks the Thunder have in this coming draft. Let's say it's five to make the math easy. Instead of 60 picks in the NBA draft, there would be 55. That's how you fix tanking. You want competitive integrity to return to the NBA? You want to avoid these horror shows? Take away draft picks. Punish teams for not trying to win. Teams should always try to win. Always. I don't care what their circumstances are. That's sports. Cinderella stories happen all the time. We should punish the Thunder for purposely putting out a roster comprised of players that may not even be good enough for the G League. This is embarrassing. And to anyone who had to watch a second of that game... I feel really bad for you. I'll close this show out with the Trailblazers firing Neil Olshee. He was under an investigation because of allegations of misconduct, like intimidation, going off on curse word filled temper tantrums, and... Just, all in all, being a bully. This wasn't an NBA investigation. This was a team investigation. And when the investigation was finalized, she was fired. Now, the investigation won't be released. It won't be discussed. So we don't know exactly what she did. The one thing I'll say is, from a basketball perspective, the Trailblazers are in a really tough spot. Damian Lillard is already frustrated. He wants to play for a contender. The Trailblazers, at this very moment, are the nine seed. So their playoff spot isn't guaranteed. They'd have to go through the play-in tournament. They'd have to beat the Nuggets and then beat the loser of a Clippers-Timberwolves game to get into the playoffs. If you want Damian Lillard to commit to you long-term and to not want out, the last thing on earth that can happen is for the GM to be fired because he's a bully. If you want to fire him because of performance-based reasons, I totally get that. Olshi has been with the Blazers since the 12-13 season. He has only gotten out of the first round three times. That is inexcusable. I mean, Damian Lillard has a right to be upset. It wouldn't surprise me if he wanted out very quickly. The Chauncey Billups experiment doesn't seem to be working out. I mean, you've got him publicly calling out their compete level. The Blazers are 1 in 10 on the road. They're 10 and 2 at home, but 1 and 10 on the road. I mean, Billups has not done a great job his first year. I'm not saying he won't work out, it just hasn't gotten off to a good start. 
Let me ask you something. How confident are you that Damian Lillard is going to finish out his contract with the Blazers? He signed through 24-25. Do you really think he's going to stick around? I don't. I think he's going to pull a James Harden. Or an Anthony Davis. Or a Carmelo Anthony. He's going to want out. And I won't begrudge him for it. It's a really bad time to be a Blazers fan right now. Their future is incredibly murky. In fact, I'll make a prediction right now. On opening day next year, Damian Lillard will not be a Portland Trailblazer. I don't know where he's going to go. But he won't be a Blazer. New York Jets instant recap comes your way right after their game on Sunday. Brooklyn Nets show comes your way Monday night. Regular episodes of the Jacob Volk show come your way every weekday afternoon. Although I will say this, not next week, but the week after, you're not going to get any shows. From the 11th to the 19th, I'll be in Florida. Until next time, I'm Jacob Volk, and always remember, if you disagree with me, you're wrong.